Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for coming out tonight to our Touring in the EU, a year of music event. Um, tonight, we've got our panellists here. We've got Tim Brennan from Carry On Touring, Ian Smith, who's also Carry On Touring, Dave Webster, who I keep wanting to call Watson, but he's Webster, <laughs> <laughs> from the Musicians' Union. And what I always say, our very own Tracy Braven, Mayor of Yorkshire. And finally, your chair for tonight, Pat Fulgoni, who's uh, from Chocolate Fireguard. Okay, um, I hope you enjoy the event, and I hope you find everything that's fed out to you tonight interesting. Um, if you have any questions, just raise your hand, and I'll try and run over with the mic so that you can ask your question. Okay, I'll now hand you over to Pat. We will uh, carry on. Okay. Thank you. Hi. So um, before we start, um, because this is streaming via our local council's YouTube channel, I'm obliged to um, read a disclaimer, if that's okay. <laughs> I'm getting more and more into this disclaimer as I read it, actually. Um, we would like to make it clear that what is said during the seminar does not constitute tax or legal advice, and that musicians should seek professional advice in those matters. Also, that the information is accurate to the best of our knowledge on the day, and that musicians, artists, producers, technicians, and creatives accessing the event should check with both UK legislation and the legislation regarding the countries they are visiting as the information is subject to change. Okay, do you get that? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Cool, cool. And before we get into the nitty gritty, Ian is going to say a few words in solidarity with the Ukraine. Yeah, um, thanks, Pat, and thanks very much. Um, there is no disclaimer on what I'm about to say. Um, I have friends in Ukraine, I have friends in Russia. I worked with many Ukrainians as well. And my thoughts, as I'm sure everyone here tonight uh, and everyone around the world, go out to our Ukrainian <coughs> brothers and sisters, and also to our Russian brothers and sisters, to whom this is also anathema. I would like to say um, that we're with everyone who is against any sort of violent action, as this no doubt is seen by virtually everyone watching this, and everyone in, and everyone in the room tonight. And also, I'd like to say as well, what we're going to be talking about today is about reducing barriers to us all being together and us being able to share our culture with other cultures and other peoples around the planet. Brexit has created some difficulties which we need to find solutions for. And it's part of what Tim and I do with Carry On Touring and what I do with UK Arts Work Info, which I'll talk about more later. It's to keep people connected Violence of the sort that's happening in the Ukraine at the moment is exactly for what we all stand for. Thank you. Okay, so um, these last two years have been a bit of a shocker for the music industry. Between COVID and Brexit, much of the music biz is on its knees. And don't get me started on how lockdown by stealth has challenged venues, in particular dance genre nightclubs. Um, but today, it's all about solutions. Um, I'm really chuffed that Sarah and Kirklees have gone for two panel proposals, and I'm happy to be working with them in this way to help prepare the town for Year of Music 2023. May I just take this opportunity to add my second collaboration, which is a Love Music Hate Racism panel on the 24th of March. And we will be discussing diversity and racism within the music industry, followed by a stonking lineup of, con of a concert ranging from blues to jazz, then later on through to a club night where we will be um, showcasing some of the best garage, house, bass line, and drum and bass artists, and that will be taking place at Basement Studios. 
So about this panel, um, touring in the EU post-Brexit, I'm determined to try to rein in my Tourette's. Did you get that? Tourette's, <laughs> right? It seems quite a natural thing to be swearing about what we've been through as an industry, but I, I will do my best. Um, I'm a singer and I'm by no means an expert on post-Brexit touring. So I hope you're going to find this panel as interesting and as useful as I will. I really miss touring myself. I sing across a few styles from drum and bass to live blues and soul music. And a few years ago, I, I was um, touring my own band, which was local, Carver Carver, around the States, China, Asia, Europe. And um, I realized touring is an essential part of the recovery for our industry, which we must remember was once our third largest export. So we've got a fantastic panel of experts for you today. The second half is largely going to be Q&A, but in the first half, we're going to have some introductions so that you can learn about our esteemed guest speakers. And after that, we'll be discussing some of the essential topics, carnets and musical instrument exemptions, merchandising, both imports and exports, Schengen visas, work permits, and cabotage. That's quite an interesting word, cabotage. Yeah. yeah. But before that, I think we should have a show of hands um, so that we can understand who's in the audience. And I know, I know that's tricky with the streaming, but um, I'd be very interested to know how many of you are musicians. Okay. Well, a bit. I'm half, half a musician. <laughs> well, everyone, Pat. Yeah. Pat, everyone's a musician inside. Yeah, it's true. Inside, yeah, yeah we're all musicians. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, any agents in the house? No? Technicians? Very good. Other creatives? What does that mean? Mm -hmm. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's fine. Any other agendas? <laughs> So, introductions. I think we should start with Tim Brennan, who I'm really chuffed has made it to the HUD. I'd like to thank you for including one of my videos, um, asking the politicians to uh, pull their fingers out politely. That was a highlight of last year. So, um, give it up for Tim Brennan from Carry On Touring. So, yeah, hi, I'm Tim Brennan. <clears throat> so, I'm a freelance video engineer or director. I work on large concerts, so talking Lady Gaga, um, Madonna, uh, Chemical Brothers, Meatloaf, you name it. I've been all over the planet. I've done it for 30 plus years. And it's basically my life and I love doing it. Um, I started the Carry On Touring petition, which was about um, work permits and and visas uh, and working in Europe, because I see working in Europe is a major thing for us. Yeah. Um, it's an excellent stepping stone for me to get out to, to other parts of the world, um, into uh, picking up tours in the States, etc. And that's why I think it's so important. Um, I don't know how much you want me to go on, but... Go. Right. No, no pressure. Right. <laughs> Let me just say one thing: is that you would normally find me backstage in the dark. No one ever sees me. I'm quiet, and I'm, so I'm not used to doing this sort of thing. This is one of the first things I've done. So, um, yeah, it's one of the first things that happened when I we I did the petition. It it went viral over Christmas of 2020, what, 20, 2020 Yeah. Um, and I sat and watched it. It went from 6,000 to 10,000 to 100,000 in six days. And it reached 286,000 um, in the end. It's one of the higher ones that's been around. Um, it was pushed by people like Tim Burgess and Dawn French and stuff like that. And that's what really pushed it over the, over the top. And I, I, I'm grateful for that because I think it's a really important um, uh, uh, petition to to make people aware of what what the situation is and is it how difficult it is now going to be to try and go back to what i was doing freely 
I could hop in a tour bus and go anywhere around Europe without any issues. Um, now we face cabotage, uh, carnets, work permits, yeah. Schengen visas, all yeah. of it. You know what I mean? It's, it's a, a massive issue. Um, it's not just bands that I tour with, the sort of larger acts, it's the smaller guys as well. You know, the guys that jump in the splitter van and, and, and throw a few instruments in the back and off they go. Um, the, there's a lot of issue where people don't actually know what is that actually happening and what, what needs to be done to be able to do it legally. Um, so with this excellent panel, hopefully we can try and explain some of that tonight. Am I right in saying that you're about to get a parliamentary award yeah. for, the, for, the, uh, <laughs> for the petition? We should do, really. Um, the petition, yeah. we've uh, been basically nominated for the parliamentary petition of the, of the year award. Um, yeah. Which uh, I'm, I'm very, very pleased about. It, it would be a huge boost to the campaign, um, as, you know, along with Ian as well. Um, yeah. <laughs> and for those on the streaming, what's the URL for the campaign? Okay, sorry. The campaign is uh, it's www.carryontouring.uk. Yeah. Um, we basically create the website. Um, there's a lot of information on there. I'll try and keep it updated as much as I can when I'm not working. Um, and, and feel free to ask me any questions about that sort of side of it. Thanks very much. Okay. Um, next, we've got the fantastic Ian Smith, who is also carry on touring and Frusion and lots of other services. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go from there. Thank you very much, yeah. Pat. Um, <laughs> I was getting myself in a hole there. Yeah, don't go too far. <laughs> now, just to explain everybody, people here in the audience and also people online streaming it, um, my background is, sort of covers around 35, 40 years of being in the creative arts industries, both as a musician, a sound engineer, a promoter, uh, worked with Arts Council England, and for eight years I was national chair of one of the UK Musicians Union sections, which was the folk roots and traditional music section. That was back in the day, along with my namesake, who's also called Ian Smith. So don't get us confused, that's the Ian Smith who was also employed by the MU, but I'll not go there. So the other things that I've done over that period of time, apart from being musician, producer, etc., I started two music agencies back in 2000, working mainly with folk roots and trad music, and then that expanded a lot. So nowadays I'm agent for everyone from Phil Rudd from ACDC to someone from Cirque du Soleil, but everybody in between as well. Two years ago, actually four years ago, I got incredibly hacked off. You do in the music industry generally, but generally for the creative arts industry, with this thing called Brexit. So I thought, what, what can I do about this? Because I'm getting lots of people talking to me about, well, what's it going? What, how does it affect us? Then I was beginning to get promoters in the UK and the EU because I work all over the planet. There's around 300 artists on the roster. So I thought, I've got to do something to give clear, fact-checked information to people so that they could make proper decisions about what they wanted to do, either to travel or to book the artists. How much is it going to cost me? What am I going to have to do? So I created something called UKEArtsWork.info. It's a totally apolitical, insofar as anything's apolitical, non-commercial fact-check site. www.UKEArtsWork.info. Totally free. And that went crazy. And then this fine chap next to me, Mr. Tim Brennan, spotted me somewhere in the Netherlands of Twitter or somewhere and asked me to join him in the Carry On Touring campaign. I said, after thinking about it five seconds, yes, sure, of course. It's a great idea, a really good thing to do. And what Tim was doing in creating an atmosphere where people could talk about this and actually have a better understanding of what it means now to carry on touring was mainly around being able to tour without the need of work permits and visas. Just to clarify, Schengen visas don't actually apply to anyone as such in the UK. Those are for visa nationals. I'll get into that in more detail later. But the problems that we have that Tim has raised through the campaign, I'm co-director with Tim on the campaign, is that we need something called a visa exemption. ISM, MU, BEC2, a lot of the unions are with us on this as well. Um, but that's maybe a little bit too much detail. So I'm here today to support Tim, the MU, Tracy, Pat, everybody here who's trying to make it easier 
Brexit, <laughs> some people will say it's not done yet. I'm not going to go there. The reality is we now need solutions or need clear fact-checked information so you know what you can do. And when you're arguing with a promoter over in France or Spain or Italy or Croatia, Czech Republic, they say, oh, it's too difficult. You say, no, we can do this. This is what we can do. So it's gone a bit crazy since I started it, and I'm here to answer your questions on carnets, cabotage, work permits, visas, 27 different irrespective of what DCMS say, I can say that because I'm independent, irrespective of what DCMS say, there are 27 different um, work permit-free requirements around Europe, and I can answer some of those questions. So without any more ado, I shall pass back to Pat. Thank you very much. And we've got Dave Webster next from the Marvellous Musicians Union. They've been very handy to me over the years, and I must say it would be a really good idea to join your union if you can. Over to Dave. Yeah. I'll use his. All right, thank you very much. It saves me shouting. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Uh, very nice to see you. Thanks, Pat, for the invite. Thank you, Kirklees, for the invite to come and uh, be on this panel and to carry on touring. My two colleagues that uh, only really in the last year or so that I've, I've really got to know these guys because we speak pretty much on a weekly basis on these issues. So I'm Dave Webster. I'm the National Organiser for Live Performance for the Musicians Union. We represent 32,000 members uh, across the UK, professional musicians, and uh, we've been doing that since 1839. And if you're not a member, you can join for a pound, six months for a pound. Very good. Anyway, go online and do that. But what I'm here tonight to talk about and to pick up on some of the things that 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 Tim and Ian have said. It's about getting information because uh, prior to 2020, when the TCA landed on our mats, the, the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, which is the, the, the book of words that governs, you know, how things happen with, uh, with the EU and the UK. Uh, up to that point, we thought we'd be okay. We were told we'd have something in it that would look after the creative industries. And when it landed on the mat, uh, on the 1st of January, whenever it was, 2020, we realised that uh, that wasn't the case. There was nothing in it at all. It was a no-deal Brexit for the music industry, for the creative industry. Um, and so, well, uh, from that point onward, it was kind of my task to um, try and unpick it and try and find ways of providing musicians with the right information because... There wasn't any, really. We were in a bit of a, a dark world um, all of a sudden, from, from going from being freely able, as somebody said, you know, get on a train, pick up a gig in, in, in France that night. You get the call. Can you come and do a gig in France that night? Yes, you can. You get on the Eurostar, you go, and you do it. You can't do that anymore, not without a lot of planning. And so um, this is kind of what I've been working on um, with a lot of industry people. We've been badgering the government for clear, concise information uh, for musicians. Uh, and they've, after a lot of banging on their door, we're, we're now having more successful dialogue with the DCMS, the Department of Culture, Media and Sport. But it's not just them. It's the HMRC. It's the DFT, the Department of Transport. It's the Department of International Trade. There are the Cabinet Office. There are so many different government departments that are sort of all over this, and, and, and Bayes as well. And they're all producing sort of bits of guidance. And last time I looked, there were something like 44 different web pages that a musician had to look at in order to try and get the information they needed just to go and do a, a gig. So my work for the last year um, with um, live, with Carry On Touring, with um, Music uh, Ma Managers Forum, with the Featured Artist Coalition, we've all come together to really try to get this information out, out to members. And so we are in the process of doing that. We do have a, a, a now a suite of, of documents available, uh, which we can talk about tonight on all the various aspects that have been mentioned. So that's a little overview of the work, work that we've been doing. And uh, I'll hand over to, um, back to Pat, or over to Tracy. Thank you very much. Thanks. Should we give it up for um, today? <laughs> um,
I can't quite believe I'm saying this actually, but we've got um, our fantastic mayor of West Yorkshire next, last but no least. Um, and um, I'll just leave it at that actually. Thank you, Thank you so much for coming. Uh, thanks so much. And um, I'm quite honored to be here. And for those online that aren't in this venue, it is amazing. Um, it's either like Secret Garden Party or Jungle Book. I can't quite work out what it looks like, but it's a, it's a great venue and it's the first time I've been here. So thank you for the invitation. Can I also um, just um, add my thoughts to the people of Ukraine? This is a very dark time for Europe. I was on a briefing this afternoon with the shadow ministers who've been briefed by um, uh, those uh, COBRA experts. It is going to be very difficult. And there are Ukrainians and Russians across West Yorkshire who have reached out and uh, we are hopefully going to do all we can to support them uh, because it's uh, not just their loved ones that are over there, but they're also concerned for their own safety here. Um, and obviously disinformation, cyber attacks and so on. So it is an incredibly worrying time. But I'm very, very pleased to be here. For those of you that don't know, I'm Tracy Brabin. I am the mayor of West Yorkshire. Um, before that, I was the MP for Batley and Spen, which is my hometown. I was born in Batley. I took over after Joe Cox was um, sadly, tragically murdered. Um, in the five years uh, I was the, uh, the MP, I spent four of those on the front bench, uh, I was the Shadow Early Years Minister, then uh, Shadow Secretary of State for DCMS, Shadow Culture Minister, um, but also one of the greatest honours of my uh, time in Parliament was to be the co-chair of the all-party parliamentary group Gaps in Support, um, trying to, as soon as we got into COVID restrictions, I knew the creative industries were going to be on their knees because we would be the first to close down, the least understood, and the last to come back. So um, we still are suffering. I know there are so many uh, still struggling, but can I just for, in this moment, thank the trade union movement actually for all they've done to support creatives during this terrible time. People having handouts, needing handouts, selling homes, moving back with parents when they've got kids of their own, selling cars, trying to get through and more tragically than anything, leaving the sector. So um, I tried to make the case to Rishi Sunak, sadly he didn't listen, um, but uh, I'll continue to make the case for creatives as your mayor. So I've been invited to speak for about eight minutes uh, around uh, my role as mayor, how I'd like to support this campaign. And can I just say, Tim, you're a brilliant campaigner. In my <laughs> DMs every day was yet another, share this, share this, share this, Tracy. And um, I was more than happy to help. So thank you for all the work that you've done. Um, uh, growing up in Batley, I was inspired by the Batley Variety Club. And anybody who's my age will know what that means. And as a young actor going to auditions and they're saying, where are you from? I say, I'm Batley, Batley Variety Club. And the reason that was so brilliant was that it was not just people of color coming to Batley, but it was Americans and talented superstars coming to Batley. And it gave us all that sense of pride and that glint in our eye that we were somewhere special, that people would want to come and be brilliant. And, um, you know, music was my, uh, growing up was my sanctuary as well. I, I grew up in a, a council flat with my sister and being able to enjoy, and please don't, this is so cheesy, you know, David yeah. Cassidy and, uh, um, you know, uh, the Bass Issue Rollers, I was a huge fan. Um, but th that music uh, transported me to a different place. And we know, don't we, that music is like a gift handed down from generation to generation and, and something that we remember as our first dance at our wedding or the music we played when we heard that someone died or the, the, the music that was at your graduation. Music is so important to our life. We can never underestimate how important it is. So live performance, of course, that is also the moment when you really vibrate with the music, that, that bass sound, that connection, somebody live performing using their talent in front of you. When I was the MP, um, obviously I come from a theatre background, I was able to set up the Batley and Spen Youth Theatre, working with musical talent from the West End. Uh, we did uh, Les Mis 
in a disused warehouse that Oxfam donated to us. And the lives of those young people have been utterly transformed by that production because West End talent mentored them. So many have gone on to fine drama schools, gone into the industry, pivoted away from the things they were going to do. They thought they could only achieve and really reached. And it is something I'm hugely proud of and will never forget. And certainly that, that, that self-esteem that came from it. And I do remember being in Tesco's when um, uh, one of the colleagues at Tesco's came up to me and said, um, you're Tracy Brabin, um, our Alice is doing stuff for you. And Alice, smart, who please remember that name, she's going to be a superstar, um, only then went on from Batley and Spen Youth Theatre to write a play picked up by the National Theatre, produced at the National Theatre, and has gone on to Guildhall Drama School. And it's going to be phenomenal. She was only 18 when she wrote the most phenomenal play about um, a, a gay couple, uh, women, and reflecting on their past when they were young and, and it was back and forth with time zones. And I said to her, and I don't think she really clocked what I was saying, when uh, I said to her, did you get much help, you know, when the National took over, help, help curating the, the, you know, the, the, the drama? She said, no, not really, just didn't use enough Beach Boy music. And, you know, she wrote every bit of that play and I'm hugely proud of her. So taking my interest in culture into my new role as the mayor for West Yorkshire, we didn't have a culture committee and it was really remiss, I thought. Um, I think culture uh, impacts on everybody's life. It is part of well-being. It's about opportunities and skills. Um, it's about bringing um, a film studio of the north to West Yorkshire. It's about uh, social prescribing. Uh, and I've been really pleased that we're out of the mayoral money, the gain share, we've been able to allocate £11.5 million for that committee. And creating that creative new deal with um, part of the committee will be a, a subcommittee Music is going to be so important. So I'm really hoping we can work quite closely together on that. So let's get to the meat of the evening. 2019, touring musicians generated almost £300 million in Yorkshire and Humber, with over 750,000 tourists coming here to see live performances. Across the country, 33 million people attended live music events, spending £5 billion in our economy. But of course, you can't talk about touring without talking about Europe. It's our backyard. And in, 19, in 2019, rather, UK artists played almost four times as many shows in the EU as they did in North America. And research shows that 21% of musicians were earning more than a quarter of their income at touring in the EU. We know how important this is. But despite creative industries contributing a massive 116 billion pounds to the UK economy, our Brexit deal with Europe included no provision for the creative industries. It means that some of our bands and backstage workers for whom touring is in your and their DNA emerged from lockdown to, to find mountains of red tape. And it's made touring not just undesirable, but unviable for some. Even the Kaiser Chiefs, I'm a huge fan of the Kaiser Chiefs, West Yorkshire's, one of West Yorkshire's most successful bands, had to rethink a visit to Italy facing after facing a new 10% withholding tax over there. So for smaller bands, for artists, backstage workers, emerging bands, how difficult is it going to be to navigate 27 different rules in 27 different, uh, different countries? Questions like, do I need a visa or a work permit? How long can I go on tour without one? Can I tour at all? How many stops can our trucks make before we need to leave the EU and come back again? Can I be a technician or a driver on two different tours back to back? Or do I need to leave and come back? Now, I want you to know, and this is why I'm here this evening, that there is support out there for you. We need you to flourish. You are our, our beating heart of our creative industries. So if you're hesitant, speak to the MU, carry on touring and countless others. The Incorporated Society of Musicians do a really easy digital guide on visas and work permits in Europe breaking down what you can and can't do in each country. But until then, you've got my full support because I know of your value to our communities. Of course, it's not only jobs, opportunities, training and skill, but it, it's about pride, the pride I had that I came from Batley. And it's the pride that we have in our region and our Yorkshire bands, our Yorkshire musicians, our Yorkshire identity shared on the European stage. 
So I will always be your advocate. I'm here for you. I'm here to listen to you, what you have to say this evening. I don't know as much as technical detail as our smart fellas here do about the minutiae of cabotage, even though I did speak on it in the House of Parliament. Uh, but I'm, I'm, here, I'm here to talk to you uh, and hear what you have to say. So thank you so much for the invitation today. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're going to have some Q&As in the second half, but I was wondering if there was any questions you'd like to fire at um, Tracy in the meantime. Any burning questions? Don't be shy. We can do it. Maybe we've not had enough beer yet. Yeah, we need some beer. We need some beer. <laughs> more beer. More beer for sure. <laughs> Who's getting around in? <laughs> okay, well, we'll move, we'll move on then. We're coming to the essential topics section, okay? And um, I think we're going to start with carnets and musical instrument exemptions. Who yeah. would like to I'll, kick off? I'll kick off on that. Yeah. Yes. I think we've got a problem. Oh, oh there you go. In. Was, was, try that. Then. One, two. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. I'm on. Carnets and musical instruments. Um, two different bits of legislation that you've got to think about on portable musical instruments. So as far as the UK is concerned, portable musical instruments and equipment can be taken through uh, as personal sort of hand luggage, if you like, um, in a vehicle or on foot. But you get to the EU and the bit about equipment from the work that we've been doing uh, is missing. So you're going to get stuck if you're trying to take um, a van load of instruments and uh, a bit of back line or mixing desk, pedal boards, that sort of thing. Uh, because the two bits of legislation don't really match up. So if you're taking more than just a portable musical instrument, like if you're going on a plane with your guitar on your back and to, to, to pick up a gig somewhere in Europe, then you, you're going to be okay. You're not going to need a carnet in, in that respect. And we've seen the legislation on both sides. that says you can go through the, the green channel, nothing to declare, uh, and you're okay. But the minute you start to put some things in the back of a splitter van, um, and it might just be your portable musical instruments, which are your own personal belongings, but then you've got a bit of backline and things like that, you might be okay leaving the UK, but you won't be okay getting into the EU. In that case, you are going to need a carnet. So... Uh, that means you've got to spend some money, which you didn't have to do before. Uh, it's not cheap, but it is essential because if you don't have one, you will be liable for all manner of fines and, and issues like that. Can I just jump in a second? Yeah. For anybody out there that doesn't know what a carne is, it's a, it's a document that allows temporary export and re-import of equipment. So it's just equipment, not merch or anything. So if you're taking it out, you're bringing it back, you're not going to sell it whilst you're away. Yeah. So that's what a carne is. Yeah, and you, you basically list all your all the things that you're taking out with you and you bring them all back again. In that case, you're not going to be paying uh, duty and VAT and that sort of thing on, on the export and import. Now, we looked at this and realized that it's, there's now an expense for, for musicians. So we spoke to the London Chamber of Commerce and we spoke to Boomerang, who are an independent company who works through the Liverpool Chamber of Commerce. And they have uh, sort of got a discount scheme in place for musicians union members uh, to, to be able to purchase their carnets. Uh, you can get them from sort of two months, six months to a year. I think the maximum they last for is a year. But you do have to have one if you're taking more than just your violin, your sax, your guitar and that kind of thing. It's, it pains me to say it, but that's the nature of the beast that we're, we're looking at now. Well, one other thing on carnets, they don't just work for EU and the UK. An yeah. ATA carnet, as it's called, which lasts for the periods of time that Dave's talking about, are for other territories around the planet as well. So if you're buying a carnet for a set period of time, don't think you just have to do it for the EU and that's it. If you're touring other places, if you're lucky enough to, you can also use it in those other places. Yeah, it's about 86 countries around the world that are signed up to the ATA Carne. So that's the sort of um, headlines around, around portable musical instruments uh, and Carnes. We have produced a guide to this, uh, which is on the website. If you remember, you can get into that. The other thing I wanted just to quickly talk about is a flowchart that we put together um, back at the end of 
2019, which basically takes you through the process and all the things you need to think about. And one thing I'd say, if, for example, if your musical instrument has an, any endangered species in it, like a bit of rosewood or a bit of ivory, uh, then you're going to need a musical instrument certificate. And that needs to get stamped on the way out and the way in. And for a musical instrument certificate to be stamped, you need to go through a designated port. So it's all there on the, on the website. All the list of all the designated ports are there. But you do have to get that document stamped. Now, you can get a musical instrument certificate from the um, Animal Plant Health Association in, in Bristol. And we've been speaking to them. And there's pages and pages of documentation on the website about how you get a musical instrument certificate. They are free at the moment. And they last three years. This is only if you've got certain species of... Uh, endangered species within your instrument. You don't need one if you haven't got any, so don't worry about that. But it, it is important when you go into the EU and out that you use a designated port. So, Can I just add to that? So the reason, it's called a CETA certificate, by the way. Before Brexit, you never got checked. That's why it's important now. But as you go in, through, in and out of customs now, you could be checked. And if your instrument does contain an endangered species part, Obviously, it's not a live thing jumping around your guitar, but it means that your instrument, if it's not certificated, can be confiscated and destroyed. And it does happen. That's an extreme thing, but yeah, yeah well, it could I mean, you know, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's the yeah, bottom line. Yeah, yeah. It's happened. <laughs> it actually happened to a, a guy a few years ago. It was a famous case where an American musician was coming in and he was using indigenous wood flutes that were specially made for him. And um, they, uh, not into the UK, but it was a CETA's problem, and they confiscated his wood flutes um, because they were not sure about what was in them. And then, sadly, they destroyed the instruments. But it is extreme. Yeah, I mean, I've, 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 it's happened in Austra uh, in America as well. With yeah, the, yeah, so it is, what, you do need to be aware. Yeah. Cool. Is that, is that everything on um, Carnes? I'm aware that we've only got so much time. Very, yeah, very so quick I, thing I, I on... Just, can Sorry. I just quickly add, um, as, a, as a tech, from a tech side of stuff, um, if you're taking your toolkit out, out on the tour, those tools need to be on the car, mate. Yeah. Okay. There's yep. ju just a real quick one. There's a little bit of vagueness around this, unfortunately, is down to the customs officer you happen to be speaking to. Because the legislation is old, a portable musical instrument, which is in the legislation for the EU, it actually says portable musical instrument. Now, is a looper a portable musical instrument? Is an effects pedal a portable? You so it's a grey area. You can probably get away with a couple of pedals, in, if you're a guitarist or you would use that sort of thing, but it is very specific, and there are no other portables exemptions that we know of. So, you know, if you're a photographer, I was asked this a few months ago. No, you can't take your camera through. That's not a portable musical instrument. So, it's strictly defined as a portable musical instrument. Just to be clear. And if you've got any questions, speak yeah. to the people who issue them. The London Chamber yeah. and Boomerang will be very happy to take questions, you know, when you're when you're applying for your carnet. So that and they they really will help. Yeah. I think the next topic, and I've got visions of huge jackets but filled <laughs> up with CDs. As I said earlier, the Ryanair jacket that yeah, you used Ryanair to be able to buy yeah. with lots yeah. of pockets. <laughs> I am massive, honest. There actually um, was a Ryanair jacket you could buy. Yeah. <laughs> So we're going to talk about merchandise, imports and exports. I don't know who wants to kick right, that one off. Yeah, well, okay. so I'll have a go. <laughs> Dave's on the merchandise. case. Merchandise. It's, 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 we'll do it together because yeah, it's horrible. It's immensely complicated. Again, there's bits of legislation which don't match up. So in simple terms, there is a bit of legislation in the UK that says that you can you can leave the UK, into the UK with merchandise of less than £1,500 worth and a thousand kilograms in weight in your baggage okay. cool. <laughs> um, per person, and uh, for that you um, you can you can go through the um, uh, self de uh, online declaration, simple online declaration. You do have to make an export declaration, but it can be much simpler if it's below those thresholds. The problem is when you get to, again to the EU border. And the financial amount is only a thousand euros, and that will be dependent on the exchange rate at the time that you cross the border. So uh, when I last looked, it was meant it was around about eight hundred and 
5860 pounds worth so the 1500 pounds worth in the uk is only good to get across the uk border but then you've got to get into the eu so that's problematic if you take anything more than those amounts with you you're going to have to make a full online a full declaration and that's quite a complicated um, area and we don't have time to go into the detail again there's there's documents uh, on the mu website that we've been working on that that try to take you through the process of doing that but it is complicated and there's vat and duty to think about if your merchandise is not um, manufactured fully in the UK. So it's the rules of origin that apply. So if you're taking T-shirts and you've bought your T-shirts uh, from uh, in, in China, let's say, the T-shirts are made in China, and then you send them to somebody in the UK to get them overprinted with your logo, that's not enough to say that they're manufactured in the UK. So they would fall foul of the rules of origin, in which case you would be paying VAT and duty on those T-shirts. Um, as I say, it's complicated. There are people who do this, uh, customs uh, um, organizers, freight forwarders and people like that. Again, you know, pick up the phone, speak to the people that, that, that do this, and they may be able to give you some detailed advice. But um, you'd need to check. There are ways of checking what duty would be payable and what VAT would be payable in which country. Um, do you want to yeah, I'll, I'll just say a couple of things on this. I'll try and break it down a bit more. Basically, there's a different ruling entering the EU border as there is leaving and, um, entering and leaving the UK border. So you've got two sets of rules, basically, that don't exactly marry together. In some ways they do, in other ways they don't. Certainly in the amount that's allowed, doing a simple declaration, whatever you have to do, the simple declaration can be online or you can walk through the red channel and declare to the customs officer, I've got less than 1,000 euros, officer, of gear here that I'm going to sell, but it's the value of the goods, not the resale value, okay? So that's not so bad. Um, the problem is that there's no, <sighs> there's no synergy that's easy to see. There's another problem. If you ring up HMRC in the UK and ask for advice, they'll give you advice. But they'll only give you advice about the UK border. So don't assume that the advice is for both borders. It's not. It's only the UK border. And rightly so, they say, we're only responsible for this. A case came up around six months ago. Some of you online and some of you maybe in the room maybe have heard of duplicate lists. A duplicate list was the old way of moving goods in and out of the UK. And HMRC were actually recommending to people, instead of carnets, I'm sorry, I'm jumping back to carnets, this is not about merch, that use duplicate list instead. They forgot to tell the people that they are given the advice to that it's only for the UK border. So please, the message on this is please check carefully either through the MU site, the ISM site, my site at UK Arts Work, whatever, but look at the detail. It's really, really important. And don't assume that these limits mean you can just walk out of the country or walk into another country and not have to do anything. You do have to declare the goods. What Dave was saying earlier is you can avoid import duty. Into the UK, it's currently 3.3% but you cannot avoid VAT. So even if you've got less than 1,500 quid's worth of gear, you have to make a declaration about leaving the UK online, and you also have to declare the goods at the other side, wherever you go, whether it's France, Italy, Germany, Spain, or whatever. So please, it's really important to anyone out there, look at the sites. There's a lot of material there, and it's a pain in the ass to read through it. We all know that. Please don't just read the top bit. Because Dave and I know, because we ask this all the time, people misunderstand it. They go, oh, 1,500 quid, I can take that much with me. No, you can't. You can, but read the detail, please. It's really, really important so you're not going to get stopped and um, face a hefty fine. There's one other last thing I'll say. A guy rang me today, said, well, I'm going through France, so you know, I might risk it. I said, well, it's up to you. I don't advise that at all. But in France, for example, there are no civil penalties for customs infractions. He said, oh, great. I said, no, not really. They're all criminal. <laughs> so seriously, there are no civil penalties in France for customs infractions. And then we went on to talk about something we'll talk about later called ETIAS, which means that's the pre-authorization for being able to go into the uh, Schengen area, the EU. If you have a criminal record, 
potentially down the line when ETIAS really kicks in and it's tied into uh, criminal record checks, people going in and out of the Schengen border, if you've got a criminal record for something, even if it was for just accidentally taking some T-shirts in to France, it might flag you. So that's all I want to say. Please check carefully and don't take unnecessary risks. It's really not worth it. Often, often good to use a customs agent because yeah. they will, they do know about these things and they do do it. That's Tracy, you can could I, can I just ask a question? Just because, as a creative, we're not really our minds aren't set up for all this detail. We're not always <laughs> across the detail. I'm not speaking yeah, about know. myself, of course. Um, are there any countries where it's a bit more straightforward? Because what I want to do this evening is try and encourage people yep. not to be daunted mm. yeah, sure. by touring in Europe. And this evening, it's, it, I mean, obviously, it's, it, there are things that need to be done, but are there any other sort of easier options where we could at least get people yeah. back out there? I can answer that really easily and quickly. If you're a musician, the regulations for working in the EU as of 27 states there are lots of areas that allow you to go in without any need for any work permit or anything. That's different to the Schengen visa. So you can just go and play. It's not that difficult. That's true for creatives generally, fashion, film, lots of other areas, including support workers in many countries like Germany, France, Finland, um, Austria. So that's not so bad. The, the painful bits are things like the merchandise, which is what oh. we're talking about, which is goods. We ain't going to change that very quickly. It's about goods and trade. It's not about movement of mm. people in that sense. So please don't feel that's bad. And the way around it, if you can afford to do it, you're going to go and work in the EU or you're coming from the EU to the UK, get your merchandise made there. Pay for it there and store it there. Then you don't have any oh, of those problems at all. Good. The other thing to say with something Dave was saying earlier about carnets, if you want to go and work in the EU and you don't want to pay for a carnet, get the people that are booking you to provide backline. For those of you who don't know what backline is, that's amplifiers, other bits and pieces. Just take your guitar, your violin, your bagpipes, your hurdy-gurdy, whatever you've got, and you don't take any backline with your mixing desk. So that's another way around it. I was going to come to some of the solutions later. Yeah. It's not that difficult, really. I was, you can get, get fired up now. I think really. it's going to get a bit more upbeat in the next half. Oh, oh yeah. We're, 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 we, 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 do, we do have to get a quarter of an hour break in. It might yeah, be a good the, time to do that because after the break, we're going to talk about funding. We're going okay. to talk about, you know, the, the visas. I, I just want to say one last upbeat. thing before yeah, we go, yeah. jump to the, ne the next bit. Yeah. Entering the... UK is far easier for UK, sorry, EU creatives generally. It's still not as simple as it was. And going into the EU as a whole, I'm using EU, not Europe, because we're all in Europe at the end of the day. It's just the Schengen area. It is not that difficult. The main problem of working in the EU now is the, uh, the non-visa status, which means you've got 90 and 180 days. That's very difficult for some technicians in particular, crew and support workers. That's separate, totally separate to each of those sovereign states having their own allowances. Many of them were quite generous for, for creatives. 90 days in France, 90 days in Germany, no requirement for a work permit. So we'll talk about that later, but it's not so bad. Yep. Wicked. So that's the first half out of the way. We're going to have 15 minutes to um, down a few pints really quickly. Are we allowed to say that on the stream? So you can edit that out later. <laughs> we'll be back in 50. See you in 15 minutes. This vodka Don't is go really away now. weak, by the way. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, part two. Thanks for sticking around. We're going to go straight over to Tim, and he's going to kick it off about work permits no, and visas. No, 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 not Tim. Sorry, no, Tim. <laughs> You're getting my heart attack, then. <laughs> no, I'm having something. But no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, very nice to be back here. We had a very interesting, high-level conversation during the uh, interval. So, not really. Anyway, just to give you an idea of what we're talking about and what Tracy said before the break, actually, about it's not that impossible. It's not impossible and it isn't actually that difficult. And one thing I want to say, it's really important. I know our focus tonight and in this stream, thanks to Pat and everyone who's organized it, is music. Well, this affects all creative industries, everybody. So whether or not that's fashion, film, dancers, photography, everything. And it isn't impossible. So here's the deal. I'm often asked, well, I want to go and work in the EU and in the other direction into the UK because I'm a, a UK VI sponsor for many years, give out work permits, otherwise known as certificates of sponsorship. And I answer quite simply, it's not that difficult. If you are, for example, just taking as a musician, a guitar with you or a violin or an accordion, or whatever, and you want to go, go and do a gig in an EU country, as a non-visa national, which we all are, we're third country nationals, but we're non-visa nationals, that means you don't need a visa to enter the Schengen area. You can just go. If you're going for business purposes and you are a creative, you're in luck because many of the countries in the EU, although everyone is different, give a work permit free period for you to work in that country without the requirement of any sort of work permit. So you grab your guitar, your violin, your accordion, your bagpipes, hurdy-gurdy I mentioned earlier, which is a bit left field, but hey, and you can do it. You don't need to do anything else. You buy your ticket, you go to the airport or to the ferry or whatever, and then you go over there and you walk through immigration. If they ask why you're there, you say, in France, I'm here to do some musical work or whatever, and they go, okay. Off you go. They might ask under what you need to do that, so it's a good idea to check the sites. In France and Germany, I'll give a little bit of detail. If you are a creative, you have up to 90 days in any one year free of the requirement for any sort of work permit. In Czech Republic, it's seven consecutive days or 30 days in any one year. In Sweden, it's a bit stingy it's, i think it's 12 days um in finland it's 180 days so you see where i'm going with this croatia you can go and do it but you need to pay for a registration we don't need a visa or a work permit as such so it's not so bad however the one thing that creates a difficulty and this is really um if you a musician or is working in several bands for example and you decided to go on holiday for a few days in Italy, Spain, France, Germany, Czech Republic, blah, 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 Poland, um, then Estonia, then you will be taking some of the amount that you're allowed to go in terms of your visa-free period. So there are two things to remember. Each of the countries, all of them, have their own work permit regulations, but you as a creative enjoy a vast amount of them without the requirement for any sort of work permit. So that's cool, yeah? Yeah? Yeah, yeah. yeah good. So I need some feedback. That's very, very true. I, I managed to pull off a, a tour in November with yeah, my, with my blues great. band in the Czech Republic. It was really, really easy. And one of yeah. the biggest hurdles was persuading my musicians that it was going to be easy. Of course. No, all... no offense, lads. No, the, <laughs> the other thing to remember is when you are talking to, or your agent, if, it's, if you've got an agent, is talking to the promoters in this country, all those people, the promoters, it's not impossible, it's not difficult, it's not even going to cost you any more to book a British band. If you are, I'll just say a couple of th very quick things. If you're an Irish passport holder, you have the golden passports. Yay. Means you can move freely, you can work freely, that's fine. 
if you are if you are a British citizen living in an EU country before the end of the transition period, you can work in that country and the UK without any limitations at all. You cannot go and work in all the other EU27 without limitations, but only in the country you're in. So there are different levels there. But the one thing I'm going to bring Tim in in a second, the 90 and 180 day rule. You'll hear a lot about this. Um, for everybody, you're allowed to spend 90 days in any 180 days in, in the EU, the Schengen area. And you might have seen a lot of things on the news about people overstaying, people in Spain who voted Brexit suddenly finding out they can't stay there anymore and being slightly annoyed. I make no comment. Um, but it means, in reality, that um, both in the UK and the EU, you basically can't spend more than 180 days out of 360. That's your limit, unless you apply for a Schengen visa, which is not relevant. But the problem, like we referred to earlier, it's just a problem of working it out. The UK calculate that a period differently to the EU. So the UK say you can spend that period of time in one block. The EU is more flexible in one way. You always count 90 and 180 days backwards from the day that you're counting. I don't want to get it too complicated. It's not actually complicated. It sounds it, but it's not. And that's why this fine fella here, Tim, started his petition wanting to find a way, and then he found out how horrible some of it really is, <laughs> finding a way to get around this problem. And part of the problem is trying to find a creative passport which would allow that limitation to no longer exist. You would still have the limitations in each of the countries, very generous, many of them. So you can still work quite easily, but the Schengen, Schengen amount of time and the EU amount of time, the 90 and 180 days for any purpose is a limitation on us all. And obviously for technicians in particular who are working on multiple tours and they've gone for a holiday or whatever, you've constantly got to work out how many days you have left that allows you to go into the Schengen area. So you see the difference. You've got work permit free periods, you've got the Schengen visa problem. And of course, the other problem is if you've got a band with five or six people in it, some of them have used so much Schengen time, others have used this much Schengen time. So it's spreadsheet hell for anybody. Well, that's the only downside. What more, you know, life is good-ish. So that's what I wanted to say on work permits and certificates, no, it's not certificates, on Schengen, but um, Tim, do you want to just say a little bit about why Karen Doran is pushing so hard for that? Yeah, well, as Ian's mentioned, we often find that, certainly as a, as a technician, I would do, say, two month tour with one man, then I'll finish that tour, and I'll end up on another tour that may be another two months. Well, automatically, that's taken me a month out of the EU, uh, out of my, over the top of my allowance. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. So um, there's, I'll give you a couple of examples. It's not obviously just me. There's, um, I was contacted by a tour manager uh, last week, basically said, telling me he's been offered a tour. It takes him 105 days uh, in Europe. Well, that, that obviously he can't do that because those last 15 days he's, he's out of Schengen time. Um, another example is a uh, opera singer who flies home at the weekends because that saves her days at horrendous cost of flights and the cost of the environment for doing that, but it, it allows her to keep that within that time. So what Carry On Touring, along with the MU and the ISM and countless other organisations, we're calling for a, uh, a, a what we'd like to term as a cultural passport. It's a... A, a, an exemption to being held to time limits for work permits and for well to take out the Schengen, the Schengen visa the Schengen problem. Visa. Yeah, that's 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 one of the key solutions that would would, would solve a lot of the problems is a cultural exemption. I think that's been campaigned for for nearly two years now, hasn't yeah. it? Yeah. And government could move quite swiftly on that. Yep. And I think they're just choosing not to because they're thinking yep. you can just get by. It's it's about political will. You're yeah. right. And uh, we need the political will to make it happen. 
Yeah, we're told over and over again when we speak to uh, politicians and departments that there is, n there is currently no plans to reopen the agreement. Well, not in their terms for this maybe, but it is purely political will. And it would make a massive difference. And that's something that there's an organisation being set up called the UK-EU Commission, which is looking at how we can make changes to this TCA when the time comes to actually make those changes that, 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 uh, that are within it. There is a, a time frame. I think it's 2024, 2025 is the time when it can be... Um, we can have some, some some changes put into it through the process that's, that's set out in it. And this uh, UK-EU commission was set up to look at how we can do that. And it's not just about creative industries. There are other industries in the UK that have massively uh, um, been left out of the, the TCA. So it's, it's looking at all the industries that have been badly affected by this and looking at a, a, a solution in a few years' time to maybe get something back into the TCA that looks after those industries in a better way. Now, that doesn't solve the problems that are upon us right now. You know, cabotage is, is absolutely a problem that is, is, is happening right now. But it is a, it is a longer-term solution, and there's a commission being set up to look at that. And as I say, it's, it's cross-industry. It's not just creatives. But we are uh, – the creative industry is well represented uh, on it and uh, yeah, go, go and have a look at the website. One but. thing to say on this as well that just comes at you maybe a little bit left field, but the reason we're pushing so hard and we thank massively people like Tracy and the MU and Beck2, ISM, everybody who's helped support us in the Carry On Touring campaign, is that it doesn't just impact touring musicians as such, because it, in touring for live performance, it also impacts on auditions. So if you, for example, are going over, we've, Remember, there are classical musicians as well who often have to go for auditions to work with orchestras that work all around the planet. And those orchestras, many of them are based in the EU. Many of those British musicians can no longer do that because they can't audition easily for those orchestras. Not only that, they can no longer tour with those orchestras because within the context of the tour, many are European locations for the tour for the classical orchestra the British mus musician does not have the right to work easily in each of those locations. So it's another layer of complexity that the managers of those orchestras find problematic. One last thing I'll say before I want to pitch something over to Tracy is that I was approached around a year ago by somebody from ballet. Not, uh, not for me to perform. I'll just make that really clear. No, I, I used to be a Morris dancer, but don't tell anyone. A long, long time ago. Um, no, what happened is true. Um, one thing that they came to me and they said, we've got a real problem with ballet. I said, okay, I'm not sure I can help. But um, the woman that I spoke to is very knowledgeable and was a real activist within ballet. And she said, the problem we've got with British ballet in particular is that there, there's not enough work in the UK for British ballet dancers, which... You know, it's, it's, it's not so niche. I mean, the ballet travels all over the world, but we have some fantastic ballet dancers. But the problem is for ballet, you often have to go for auditions, many, many auditions before you're even able to um, be taken on board to work with a company. And many of those auditions are in Europe. That means that Schengen visa, uh, Schengen allowance is already taken up by the time you've done all your auditions. So you can't even use that to work there. And the one thing I was going, that was just an example. I want you to understand everybody out there and here that it's massive impacts that have not even been thought about and were not even taken into consideration when the trade agreement, the oven ready trade agreement was agreed. So one thing I would say as well is that we depend, and it's something I'll reflect back to one, my comments about Ukraine, we depend on working with other people around the planet as creatives. We do it naturally because the creative community around the planet is strong and we immediately find empathy with those people. This is creating complications, which means we can no longer collaborate easily with other creatives around the planet and in the EU, our backyard. Yeah, we're often told, well, we're a global nation now. We can go and work with people in Japan or in Colombia or in America. It's not so easy. So what I would say is what we really need as well are funding channels that allow both at a local and international level 
ways of making that easier now. And maybe the catalyst of Brexit might be a way to seek further funding for those collaborative projects. Sorry, there was a lot there to unpack. Any comments? Anyone? I, I would just say about the funding, I think um, you have a point that it's an extra cost for young bands, particularly to hire people to help them navigate this potentially, or costs for time, you know, that they're not doing their day job that enables them to make money or um, enables them to rehearse. So, yeah, you're right. For me, there's no natural home for that. However, I would say that with our Creative Catalyst, we've allocated 1.2 million for that. And there is a part of that that is supporting of uh, creative co-ops. Now, looking around West Yorkshire, it's we're, we're struggling to identify uh, best practice. So one, if you are a creative co-op, if you're a group of music teachers or musicians that got together and you offer peripatetic music as a cooperative, please come to us. Um, or a photographers coming together or uh, dancers offering something as a cooperative. Um, so there's potential to, to support and help uh, advice and guidance on how to set up co-ops uh, with mentoring, etc. cetera. But um, is it uh, potentially a way with the Erasmus scheme that we can have like a trade-off with maybe a twinned uh, country in Europe where our creatives travel um, with a bit more support? I don't know. I'm open to any creative solution uh, to a difficult problem. But this, unfortunately, is governmental. Um, it is important exports, it's about, you know, immigration, and it's not something that we control. But you have a, you know, a friend in me, and if we can, if there's anything we can do, just to flag up as well, if it's of interest, uh, £6 million being allocated for Skills Connect, which is a program of, of like boot camps training um, uh, and responding to um, holes in the in sectors. So if that is you feel musicians don't have the training to understand um, touring, uh, potentially you could come to us as a group and we could try and identify that training resource. Uh, I'm very excited to see that Live Nation have taken on the Peace Hall under their wing. And that will mean enormous amount of uh, uh, big stars coming in from Europe and America. Um, and hopefully we can build those, widen our contacts and our relationships as well, um, which is a good thing. And I know that the Peace Hall are looking to have their support bands local. So that's another opportunity, I would say, for young talent. Get your... Get your uh, I was about to say CDs then, wasn't I, to, to the Peace Hall, but I'm obviously old-fashioned. Uh, get your links on uh, Spotify or SoundCloud to make it the Peace Hall because that's also another opportunity. But su I support you where I can. Thank you. There's just one thing I've remembered with something Tracy just said, and she mentioned immigration. We often get argu in arguments. We often get challenged by people saying, why should musicians be any different? Why should they be able to go and work in Europe? We can't. I'm talking about British people. And if you ever ask, if you ever fall into that argument, it's not about immigration. It's zero to do with immigration. Our bread and butter as creatives is doing one-off or short gigs in another country. It's got sweet FA, sorry, to do with immigration. And people, it's a trade issue. It's a trade issue. Yeah. It's got nothing to do with immigration. So if anybody you're talking to or arguing with ever mentions that, remember that and tell them that it ain't about immigration. It's quite unique the way creatives create a massive amount of revenue for the UK. And that means that they need to tour. Live touring brings in massive amounts of money into the UK exchequer, or did. I mean, we've had two, and a half, two years of COVID, of course, which has masked everything that we're now about to find out about with touring in the EU, of course. And um, what, what I'd welcome, and I'd say to anybody out there as well, please reach out to everybody on this panel. The yeah, MU, Karen Touring, myself, Pat, Tracy, and let us know your stories, what's really happening out there over the next year or so. It's really important that we can then feed that back, not to argue and say, hey, everyone, you made a massive mistake. It's to find solutions to make this all work better. 
we, for we, the time being. Ian's absolutely right. We keep being asked for case studies, and we are collecting them as we as we go. But because of COVID, not much has been happening. So it's very hard to say what's happening on the ground. What we need is a year of touring to happen again. And then we need to see how things are being enforced. And enforcement is a very important part of this. Because looking at all the paperwork is one thing, but how is it actually on the ground? So if anybody's out there who's doing it, do please get in touch and tell us what your experience is. If you've had a problem, if you've had a good experience. Because depending on who you talk to and depending on where you're at, you it, it might be a different story. There's a very interesting uh, blog that was put up by a tour manager that we got from from Carry On Touring that we yeah, put right. on our website that showed, that actually talked about a very positive experience. Pat, you had a, a, a positive experience going to check, but mm. we've also heard um, nightmare stories from people and people who have had to cancel tours because of uh, red tape and merchandise. So we really do need the evidence that we can then go back to government and say, this is the impact. Who's collating that data? Well, <laughs> anybody who, I mean, uh, we, we are, are. We all are. <laughs> and, yeah. yeah. That's We've, the problem. Yeah, well, I've set up a there's a um, an email address eu touring at the mu.org. If you have an experience or, or you will have some feedback about the information we've got, do please email that will come straight yeah. to me. It would be helpful, wouldn't it, to know yeah. what the sector yeah. was like before Brexit and now so one, you can make thing, that economic argument. Well, 5.8 billion to the economy yeah. was, was music, you one, know, one 111 thing, billion was the creative industries. One thing I'll say just quickly, sorry, Dave, is that. What, what we are all doing in the background are talking to many other people in the industry. We're talking to live music group. We're talking to We Make Events. We're talking to um, service industry people. We're talking to haulage. The one thing that Brexit and COVID has done, which is positive, in my opinion, is brought us all together. We're all talking to each other. We never did before as much as we are doing now within the industry. Music manager, MMF, Music Managers Federation, talking to haulage. What? You know, it's good. It's really good. But we're all trying to collate this information the best way we can. Unfortunately, the government actually said they were going to try and put pour money through DCMS into a music export office. We were in talks recently. I won't say too much about that. And it's all sort of a year later, not much has happened in terms of real progress. But we are trying to collate all this, but there's two reasons for collating the information. One, to get case studies so that we know what to say to people and give good advice. That's everybody, particularly the organizations like, that they represents, like the MU. But it's also to give that advice to argue with people who don't know the rules. And that often is customs officials and immigration officials who don't actually know the regulations. I argue with immigration all the time in the job that I do. And many times you need to give that information to you guys so that when you're sitting there in front of a customs official and they say this, it's actually this. And then you can show them the documentation to say, actually, sorry, but I'm right. And then they'll go, oh, okay. So that's really important. Thank you. Can I add that there's some sources of funding out there still. I mean, a few years ago, I managed to lobby really hard and I got a, a Yorkshire showcase together at great. the British Music Embassy venue at South by Southwest in Texas, which was great. But if, if, if a band gets offered a slot at South by Southwest, um, the problems start, don't they? I mean, how do you fund it? Mm -hmm. um, often these gigs for free. Um, so uh, when my band uh, uh, toured the States and we did South by Southwest, it cost us a fortune. Yeah. And we used to do other gigs to try and offset that tour. But I, I was always um, hassling the local independent, the, the local international trade advisors at UK Trade Investment and just saying, look, can you give us some money? And often they'd give us 50% of the costs of a project. One thing I'd say now, I'll offer for everyone here, I'm sure they don't mind, you don't mind, do you guys, everybody? Yeah. We, we'll give Pat all these links for you to check out and to get the information from um, and just use them as a resource. They're free. They're fact-checked. They're fact-checked the best That's way great. we all can, and we're more than happy to do that. It's really, really important. And things like the other thing, there's an organization called On The Move. It's a fantastic organization. It's about mobility around the planet for music musicians and creatives. I met the director a few months ago. So all that information is there to make life easier. It's not impossible. It's not. It's difficult, but it's not impossible anymore. Can I draw to, to people's attention the PRS Foundation? 
um, they do something called the International Showcase Fund. And I had a look online um, yesterday just to see if it was still on stream. And they, they said that um, the ISF offers vital export support for <coughs> UK-based artists, bands, songwriters and producers who have been invited to perform or create new music at international showcasing festivals or conferences. You might also want to get in touch with the BPI, the, uh, the trades mm -hmm. organization, because they've got this, this um, pot called MEGS, which stands for Music Export Growth Scheme. I think you have to package it up as marketing, but within that you can, you can pay for um, international travel costs. So it's well worth um, you know, researching funding because it is out there. Yeah, yeah. The the mm. ISF uh, does amazing work mm. and sends so many bands. I mean, at the moment they're just just about to go off to South by with yep. this year's uh, contingent of UK artists, and uh, it's really impressive. Have you got to be careful of match double funding? I, I couldn't go into the detail well, on, 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 on that. <laughs> well, the, the funding the that. funding is given within fairly yeah. strict guidelines. Yeah. But it's, it's been yeah. it's been a really a, a useful resource for. for to, to get has. British bands established overseas. Yeah. It wouldn't have been possible for the Yorkshire bands that we put on to have toured right. without it. Yeah. Can, I, can I just add to what Ian was saying about um, information and stuff? Um, the, the amount of people that we talk to as, as ISM, Musicians Union, the FAC, all of these organisations, as, as he's alluded to, we are all now talking. And so if you guys have got questions and we ask one of us, we may not know the answer, but we can always go to one of these other guys, get that information for you and get it back to you. So, you you know, that we're, we're, we're trying to bring that, bring that information together so that you, it makes it easier and for you guys to get out on the road and, and do what we love doing, and that's, and that's touring. Yeah, exactly. And also a, a way around having lost Creative Europe funding, because that's only available if you're in Europe, is if you can find some collaborators in Europe, and as long as they can fulfill the requirements, they can include British musicians and creatives. You're not excluded. You can't make the application yourself, but you can still access other forms of funding. Um, and it's great that West Yorkshire is doing what it's doing, and there are sources of funding around that will help you to carry on touring. So uh, that's not a subliminal... <laughs> just keep saying carry on toy. It's, it's a good choice. He made a good choice, didn't he? It's cool. Um, we've got about 15 minutes left. Should we open it up? Yeah. Yeah, we've, got yeah. some, we've got some questions online as well. If anyone's got any questions, fire them at Sarah. Has anyone got any questions in the room? Yeah. I can't see if there's a tree in the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Guy at the back there. A microphone is on its way. So people can hear you on the stream. Okay. You do really, Mike. Oh, hang on. We'll come to you in a second. Sorry. Hello. Hi. Um, I'm not sure if it's been covered by um, anybody on the panel yet, but uh, one of the things that I did wonder, um, I think it was, um, yeah, a lot of people were talking about it going into the Schengen area, but I'm just kind of thinking about places like um, Switzerland and Norway, which yeah. are outside of the european union but are still in europe yeah um traveling to them directly but also traveling through another eu country so mm -hmm. france mm -hmm. and switzerland sweden into norway um are there differences between going through a europe uh, european union country no <laughs> Sorry, I, I, to be succinct, no, it's the same as it was before. Uh, Switzerland, if you're going, you've already got your ATA car now, so hey, happy days because you had to get it to go into Schengen, and you need it's easier to use an ATA car now into Switzerland. So there's no real change at all. There's still no change. It's, Brexit hasn't affected that. Yeah. Uh, guy over here. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, uh, thanks to everyone on the panel, and Bob, uh, big thanks to Tim and Ian. You've been like a shining light for me over the last few years. I've felt sick since 2016, and even sicker as I watched it all unravel. Mm. One of the questions I've got is, in some countries, you have to inform them that you're working. Yeah. Yeah. Who do you inform, and, and how do you do that? Okay, I can answer that. It's um, Officially, you're supposed to... In each country, it's different, of course, but it's, it's like the um, work ministry in a particular country. 
So you should, by law, in each of those countries, it varies slightly from country to country, um, inform them that you're working in that country. Now, that the onus lies upon you, the musician or the creative. However, it could be the agent or the promoter. So what I am advising people to do, and this is not legal advice, but it's what I'm advising people to do, is make sure that you have from the promoter or the agent in that country an assurance that they have reported your work to the local authority that's responsible. So get the, promo get the promoters to do exactly. it. Exactly. That's yeah. the simple solution. Then, although it doesn't completely absolve you if they haven't done it, at least you can show you went in goodwill to do the show and in good faith, sorry, not goodwill, um, and that the promoter has informed the local authority because, after all, they're li liable as well to not employ people illegally. That's the, my advice. And if the promoter turns around and says... I don't know what this is or what what I'm doing, you know, because they're they're learning just just as we are as well, you if, know. If they're a small promoter, I can understand that. But however, they all <laughs> they should all they pay should their know. taxes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they should all know what they're doing if they they've got a license or they've got a gig or whatever. So their local um, business authority, whoever that might be, it varies very differently. In Belgium, for instance, there are three different ones because there's. Um, uh, Brussels, Flanders, and the other one. I can't, I can't remember, sorry. Um, and the same in in Holland, or in Netherlands, sorry, and Germany and France, etc. Would I need proof that this is being done to get through the border? No. Okay. Once you, now, something I wanted to say here, that Dave alluded to it, custom and practice. Once it all lifts, COVID, etc., we all start gigging again, properly, and over the next few years, I'm sure everything will settle down a little bit. I'm going to say this clearly that I am not suggesting this as advice. However, the reality, of once you've entered the, entered the Schengen area, there is an onus upon you to make sure you're working legally. However, how, how that is enforced in each country will vary. And you have to ask yourself, what do I need to do to make sure I'm legal against the risks of doing things that are illegal and how it might be enforced? I've said that very, very carefully, but that's then about custom and practice. Okay. Um, one last thing as well, which kind of leads on from what you've just said. I'm, I'm getting a motorhome from the UK in seven weeks' time. I'm going to go to Dover, Calais, and then play eight gigs in Germany, two in Netherlands. Happy trails. Thank you. I'm going to take a guitar, guitar pedal, bag of leads, no merchandise, what can they do to, to stop me? They can't do anything to stop you as no. such, but, I mean, that's under portables exemption. If you've got a guitar, the leads, they're not going to. Just just put them near the kettle, just tell them something to do with the kettle. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the pedals. That's are not, not official advice. That's not official <laughs> advice. It's not really. There's a disclaimer at the beginning, right? Yeah, there was. No, what I mean is, it's extremely unlikely. I mean, if by the letter of the law, some customs official sees a guitar pedal in a bag and says, "What's that? Why haven't you got a car?" Now? Then, yeah, you've got a problem. Then I'm arguing that it's portables and it's a musician. I could say, like you said earlier, this it's a is the, well, genuinely, this is the problem about that particular categorization of portable musical instrument. What I alluded to earlier, it's old-fashioned to <laughs> say that a, a, a looper is that a portable musical instrument. It's there to create a. a is it a computer? It's about definition of goods being transported through borders. Most times, and I, I can't say this for certain, but you have to argue your case if you're wanting to do that. But certainly in terms of a motorhome traveling around, I wasn't going to mention the cabotage thing, but since this sort of brings it up, Dave, I'm going to pass it to you. <laughs> Because you don't speak, you've not been speaking as much as me, so I think someone else ought to talk about cabotage. That's a really nice way of moving on the problem. But there are some issues around um, commercial licenses for travelling in a vehicle, and whether and if you're just on your own, no one's probably going to take issue with that. If you've got a band with you, that's a different situation. Yeah, I think a motorhome. You, you know, I, I've not really looked into motorhomes so much, so I think you might you might be all right. Um, Splitter vans, we had a bit of a breakthrough on splitter vans because we really felt or we were worried that they were going to be caught up with the same 
um, kind of legislation as the big trucks that are, that, are, that are now having to battle with cabotage. But we went to government and argued about splitter vans and they came back and said, and, and the EU have also agreed, that, that because they carry both goods and people and they're below nine seats and below three and a half tons, they don't fall under the auspices of the TCA, but they do fall under member state laws. So we then said, well, what are there any member state laws that might be detrimental to people using splitter vans? And, and no one could come back with any member state laws that said there, were, there was a problem. So we think if you're using a splitter van, you know, you're going to be fine as far as uh, the cabotage rules are concerned. Uh, they don't apply. Panel vans and transit vans is still in, in discussion. I can say that much. Uh, we're still trying to work out because um, a transit van uh, is potentially registered as a light commercial vehicle and this is where it gets into some really complicated stuff um but we would argue that you know if you've got three people in the front of a transit van with musical instruments and some equipment and it's less than nine seats and it's um uh, under three and a half tons it's doing exactly the same job as a splitter van is but this is the technical bit of the 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 legislation which we are we are working through as for motorhomes i think that's a different registration yeah uh and different insurance brackets and that kind of thing so um i i, I don't know that you wouldn't be okay if that's if i that's guess i'll let you know if it was a nightmare or a dream uh i think i think it's a, i think they allow you one good, phone call i think it's a good idea <laughs> Motorhome. uh yeah because you've got your hotel bills sorted. <laughs> right. I've been doing that for about seven years. Yeah. So. Yeah. All right, thanks very but, much. Uh, you know, uh, you drop us a line. If we, we know anything more, we'll, we'll let you yeah. know. There's one thing on what you just said about motorhomes or generally driving in the EU. We still get asked this occasionally. Uh, there was a suggestion you need international driving permits. You don't no. at all. No one does for driving in the EU. It was something that was raised and never, never taken through. So just your ordinary driving license and you're cool. But you do need various bits to have on board, yeah. depending on what country you go to. Like in some countries, you need to have a portable breathalyzer. Well, that's right. In other countries, France, you need yeah. high-vis vests. Also, yeah. if you're going through the Carnet route, uh, if you're going through an um, uh, inland border facility to get your uh, Carnet stamp, to make sure you've got a high-vis vest because you're going to be in a, an area which is largely frequented by massive trucks. Uh, and so often they require you to have a high-vis vest uh, when you go into those uh, inland border facilities, uh, when you cr when you're crossing the channel, um, and you've got to have a UK sticker on the back of your vehicle now. You can't have a GB one; it's got to be a UK one. Yeah, wow, you learn something new every day. That's really weird. <laughs> yeah, that came in a little while ago. There's one thing I, I was mentioned earlier, and I raised my eyebrows. In reality, the double taxation agreements haven't changed at all. So it's something I wanted to say. Some promoters in this very honest world we live in, in creative arts and the music industry, always clear, transparent, and no one's ever trying to take the ride out of anyone, is that there is no change to the double taxation agreements across the EU and the UK. However, there may be some local taxation agreements you need to be aware of. But it, if a promoter is saying it's changed because of Brexit, it's not true. So please remember that, check carefully. Um, it's not changed at all. It's a bit like in Germany where there's the, um, the main tax on income and also the, um, the reunification tax after the wall came down. That's still there. I think it's about 3%. It's weird. But yeah. Any other questions? Some over there. Hello. Uh, cool. Thanks for like having us all there, by the way. Um, just on, it seems to be like a massive grey area, just absolutely everything. That's like the vibe I'm getting, and there's no clear this, or like you have to do this, but you sometimes maybe need to do this. There are some very clear bits. There's some very clear bits, but then there's a lot of like in between that's just, yes, and quite hard to understand in two hours in an evening. <laughs> Could, well, let, let me just break it down. Um, visas and work permits across into the UK or into the EU, that's relatively straightforward and simple in terms of you need to do this and you need to do that. In each of the EU 27, there are different allowances. You can find this on various sites and, and an explanation of it. 
the the information on and the same coming to the UK from EU. That's relatively straightforward. The big problems are carnets and music and portable musical equipment, uh, musical instruments and equipment. There's a grey area there, and merchandise is really difficult to understand. Moving merch in and out of the country, uh, in and out of Schengen as well. Um, the cabotage stuff about transport and haulage is an absolute swamp, and I find myself drowning in it whenever I try to talk to people. Dave, bless his socks, has been working his ass off, and Tim talking to road haulage, etc. I'm not sure how often Tracy talks to the Road Haulage Association. Mm. Mm. Yeah, you see, so there are that lets the best left with them really, but you can find information on that across all the sites that we're talking about. And one thing that's come out of what you just said, it is confusing as hell. It's a new reality. So is there a plan to collate all that information and put it into some form of course or training document that someone could well, work it's what with we you said to earlier. fund? Or... Yeah, it's a, it's a really good point. And it's, it's, one a great we, point. it's one we've been asking for. Uh, we've been saying to the government, look, you know, Give us some sector-specific guidance that we can put the whole creative industries into one place to get all the all the guidance that they need. And they've Give been some very, funding. very reluctant to provide sector-specific guidance. They've done some. They've done some. It, it, it must be said, but not to the detail that makes it easy to understand. And it is difficult to understand. I've tried to do as much as I can as far as the MU website is concerned to give eight various different documents on, on, on the issues we've been talking about tonight. But there's also live, there's also Ian's site, there's also the ISM site in terms of work permits and visas and that kind of things. Yes, it would be great to have it all collated in one place for the creative industries. And that would take some funding. Um, we've been to the government to say, can you give us some funding? That conversation is ongoing. ongoing. I wouldn't say it was particularly hopeful at this stage. Well, but you could say it's going on. It's going on. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, we, we, we're trying to find some solution to that, to, to a really good question. Yeah. Uh, and I'm afraid I can't give you a really brilliant answer other than we're working on it. I'm going to give you a plug now for my site and me. Um, I find I get a lot of information from Dave. I speak to him regularly. I get information from Intercorporate Inc. ISM, I can't say it. Um, back to a lot of the unions and also occasionally from UK government websites, which are sometimes really difficult to get through and also very contradictory, often. Even on the same site, HMRC often tell you different things. Yeah. So what I try to do, um, I, I try to boil this down to very simple headlines, but always give links, etc., to the documentation, etc. I also have a YouTube channel. But what we've, I would love someone else to do that. And what we're trying to do, Dave and I were on a call recently about the export office, weren't we, on that Zoom thing. What we're trying to do and what we'd love to do is get one really key resource where we can all feed all of this in and it's done in clear, plain and simple language for people to understand. Because as soon as you start reading into the documentation and the links we send you, you go, what the hell is this? It's so difficult because a lot of it is in um, legalese and you have to really dig down to understand it and it takes time. And most people and most creatives maybe, I am one as well, I'm a musician and other things. Maybe I'm weird though because I'm like looking at, I'm a bit of a nerd and look at all this stuff. No, people don't want to read all this stuff. It's so dense, some of it. So we would love to be able to do that. And if we can get the funding and every, the will is there to put all the information in from the Zoom meetings we're on regularly. People want to do this and give this to everybody here and online to make life easier. So we are working on it. Could I just add that as you're exporting, um, we have got um, training and growth of managers to try and help um, in this whole new world about building exports and productivity so it may be something we could, you know, in some way try and formulate. Obviously, if you're an MU member, I'm assuming the MU runs courses. Uh, we do. We do do uh, events and courses and things like that. We haven't set what I mean, we, we've done some online stuff for members on this, actually. And I am planning to do another one because the one we did last year 
we've moved on a bit. We know a little bit more than we did last year and some things have changed. So I am planning to do another one this year, which will be an online uh, I- I event similar to this. But uh, uh, um, And so, yeah, um, we can, we, we, we'll we be doing something along those lines, yeah. And you know, that's really interesting, the language Tracy just used. You have to change your mindset. You are exporting. You're not just playing. You're exporting what you're doing. Mm. So to get funding and to get help, you have to change your mindset slightly. You don't have to change what you're doing or the way you feel about it, but you have to think how you need to speak to authority to get the help that you need. And that means you have to start thinking in terms of export. And how, why am I important to the UK as a musician or a creative? Because you do a bloody great amount of work, both economically and for the cultural wealth of the nation you happen to live in. So try and change your mindset a little bit and start using that language, and you might find it gives you some benefit. Yeah, you're not a driver, you're an operator. <laughs> Just time film. for one or Thank two you. more questions, and then we'll have to call it a day, I think. Hi. Yeah. I just want to say thank you so much for doing this. It's been really helpful, and I've Pleasure. really enjoyed it. Oh, thank thank you. you. So I'm coming to the end of um, a three-year event management degree, and with COVID and Brexit, people keep telling me it's so unfortunate you've come into the industry at the worst time, and I'm absolutely gutted. They're wrong. <laughs> It's an opportunity. I'm not kidding. It's an opportunity. It's a time of great change. Yeah. A lot of people have left the industry because of the, they got scared and, and left out. But yeah. that in itself allows us to bring on new, new blood yeah. into the industry. And that's what I think the industry needs. It needs a new, a new head. It needs a new way of thinking, as he yeah. says. You know? Let me put we, it can, we can still tour. There are difficulties. The information's out there. And like you say, we're, we're, we're trying to co coordinate that information together, you know, to make it easier for you guys. Um, and and that's that's what we need to do. And But no, it, you're, you're absolutely 100%. We need people to come on board. Yeah. It is an opportunity. I do all I do for UK Arts and stuff, totally pro bono. I fund it all myself. It's been a big opportunity for me to do that, to help people. That's the only reason I do it. And all of a sudden, people like this crazy guy here reach out to me. I didn't know him 18 months ago. Oh, God, that was a lifetime. No, I didn't know him 18 months ago. And Dave and I only started talking, even though I've been an MU member for decades. And it's brought us together. So think of it as an opportunity to find ways to make it work for you. Brexit has happened. We are in, for the time being, in a situation where there's no trade, um, no single market, uh, what's the word, customs union or anything like that. We are where we are now, so we find solutions now. We need people like you to come out fighting and getting us moving. Yeah. So it's an opportunity. That's great. Thank you. Oh, really? You kind of answered my question before I've even asked it, but I was just going to say I'm Go on. desperate to get into touring. Right. Um, I just wanted to ask, like, what would be your best advice to someone fresh with no touring experience whatsoever um as with brexit on top of that and my networking what would you what would be your adv I, advice i think the the way to do it is to speak to companies that specialize in what you want to do so if right so if you're going into event management Go and speak to all the event management companies. Go in there and say, look, I've just come out. I want to gain some experience. If you're a sound engineer, a video guy, or whatever it is, go and talk to those companies because they are crying out for people yeah. to come in and, and, and train up. One so, thing, though, be flexible. It's yeah. This industry yeah. is all about flexibility and being able to move with the flow. And that's what I have to say government has depended on in that they thought the creative arts industry would go off and sort themselves out. Well, we did, but we're now in their face and we're not going away. No. We're going to continue to try and find solutions and stay flexible. Uh, can I ask you a question? Are you wanting to s set up independently? As a freelancer, yeah. To, 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 to manage bands? So I want to get into touring with the end goal of becoming a tour manager. Okay. So, like, what I've done so far is, like, a lot of merch. So that I was looking into going into merch. 
and then maybe production assistant kind of work, TM assistant, one, on start management. Okay, one one thing that you, you might want to think about is actually doing um, a bit of training on export and import in terms of VAT, duty, all of those kind of things. And there are uh, organizations, the Institute of Export, do training days for that. In fact, I'm going to do one next week because right. I want to know a little bit more about what it means to export and import now that we've got these rules i want to understand them a bit better so maybe that's that's something you could think about um and i think it gives you a qualification as well so that 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 might help that's really useful thank you so much no problem good luck and as always if you know more than others you'll never stop working <laughs> exactly <laughs> thank you you smart yourself up and you'll be as you'll be rich <laughs> Very specific questions. Mike. The microphone. Sorry. I should know better, shouldn't I? <laughs> yes. A, very, a couple of very specific questions that I couldn't find the answer to online. Maybe you could shed some light. First of all, uh, on CITES, uh, what happens if you buy an instrument secondhand and you cannot find the specific species to put on the CITES certificate? How do you go about covering yourself for a very important export? I, I think, as Dave said, you, do you want to repeat what you said, Dave? You need to go to the place in Bristol. Who uh, they identify. won't. They won't identify your instrument for you. Oh uh, no! The, the, all they'll do is is issue a certificate. Actually, I've got an answer for you. Uh, find a friendly luthier. I'm, I'm not. I'm being serious. A friendly luthier, an instrument maker. Yeah. Um, if if you ping me an email or. A, Facebook message or something, I can put you in touch with several luthiers. That goes for anyone. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, that's one way of dealing with um, rare, rare woods and endangered species. Okay. Thank you. you. Yeah, you have to identify what it is. And yeah, then, absolutely. And, and uh, AFA will issue this, you the certificate if you need one. Yeah, and you, you can fudge it, but then if you get caught out, no, you're no, really no. stuffed, yeah. aren't you? Yeah, yeah, you don't want to do that. And in fact, I think it's an exemption for rosewood, or there was well, one. Yeah, yeah. It depends on what it is. Yeah, uh, what, what, it is. what instrument is it? Uh, various guitars. So probably exempt, yeah. but not 100% sure. We're so, not okay. working with guitar addicts tonight, particularly, <laughs> but... I'll leave. Oh, okay. I think <laughs> Ian's to, yeah, find a find a, a Luthier. Luthier. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The second know. question oh. is I'll keep this quick, chap, sorry. Um on CITES is the designated port that you have to enter and exit through. Mm -hmm. What happens if you don't have a, a convenient enter and exit port? You have to go through a designated port. You, you just port. have to yeah. anyway. I mean, we're working very hard to try and get Eurostar St. Pancras designated port. How does it work with, with uh, airports? Um, there is a list. So uh, all the designated ports in the UK are listed, okay. and you can get those through the MU site. Uh, in fact, the flowchart, which is open to everybody, it has direct links to all the listed designated ports, both in the UK okay. and in the EU. It's really important. Most, yeah. I'm yeah. told from the European side of things that most of the ports in the, in the EU are designated ports. Okay. That's but good. do That's check, all but it's all there. we've got time yeah. for, I think. We're going to have to, uh, we're gonna have to sure. hit it and quit it. the question. Yeah. Okay, no worries. But thanks very much for, for turning up. Thanks very much for Thank our you. esteemed guests. It's been fantastic. Yes. It's been a pleasure. Thank good to see you. you all. Thank you, Brian, everyone. Keep on touring. <laughs>